As with many health concerns, prevention can be important. Exercise, diet, and being careful as we move help immensely. Protecting and repairing your bones and joints. Tonight, on call with the Prairie Doc. Good evening and welcome to On Call with the Prairie Doc. I'm Kelly Evans Hullinger. The condition of our skeletal system has a significant impact on our overall health and quality of life. While some aches and pains naturally come and go, it is important to take care of our bones and joints throughout our life. First, a look at this week's Prairie Doc quiz question. The decision to undergo joint replacement surgery should be based upon A, the appearance of arthritis on x-ray, B, how much impact the arthritis has on an individual patient's daily functioning, C, the individual patient's overall health, baseline physical function and surgical risk, or D, B and C. Viewers who call in the correct answer will be entered into a drawing to win a copy of the book, The Picture of Health. Each of Dr. Holmes' essays, originally written for On Call with the Prairie Doc, comes with a wonderful accompanying photograph by Dr. Judith Peterson. We will announce the answer and the winner at the end of the show. Remember, you only have 10 minutes to get your answers in. We answer your questions about bones and joints as they are called in or sent to us via Facebook or email. Call in questions to 1-888-376-6225 or send us an email to the address on the screen. Joining us tonight in the studio is Dr. Keith Baumgarten of Orthopedic Institute in Sioux Falls. Welcome, Dr. Baumgarten. Thanks for being here with us. Thanks, Kelly, appreciate it. Yeah, so tell us a little bit about um, yourself. What do you do every day? And, and tell us a little bit about your group at Orthopedic Institute. Sure, I'm a orthopedic surgeon, fellowship trained in sports medicine and shoulder surgery. Mm -hmm. I've now been here for about 15 and a half years in South Dakota and in practice. Um, we're a uh, single specialty private practice mm -hmm. orthopedic group with multiple subspecialties mm -hmm. within it. Uh, my interest is in uh, sports medicine and shoulder surgery. So I probably do about 65% shoulders and the rest about the second most common joint is the knee, but some elbow and hip as well. Mm -hmm. Great. Yeah. So let's dive in and talk about shoulders. That's that's the most common surgery that, that or joint that you're working with. The most common thing that I see, I suppose, in primary care would be rotator cuff, um, you know, that, that spectrum of wear and tear, rotator cuff injury to, to tears and injuries. Um, so tell us about what, what type of symptoms does a patient come in with when they have a rotator cuff pathology and, and what are you looking for and what's the spectrum of treatment for that? Right, so you're exactly right. Rotator cuff problems is the most common problem someone has with their shoulder. Mm -hmm. It's the third most common musculoskeletal complaint one would see, mm -hmm. back, neck, then shoulder. Uh, rotator cuff problems typically cause shoulder girdle pain, typically in this area here. Sometimes people say, Doc, it's not my shoulder, it's down here yeah. in my arm. That's typically shoulder-based pain. Mm -hmm. uh, very common pain with activity, pain with overhead use. Mm -hmm. Night pain is a very common finding and it's actually a very debilitating source of pain. Um, the spectrum of rotator cuff disease starts off with just inflammation with an intact rotator cuff, can progress to partial thickness tears, Further on, it's full thickness rotator cuff tears. Further on with that is something called irreparable rotator cuff tears that are mm -hmm. unfixable. And the last end of the spectrum is something called rotator cuff tear arthropathy, where a patient develops arthritis secondary to having an unfixable rotator cuff tear. Mm -hmm. Now, rotator cuff tears are very common. Yeah. We believe that rotator cuff tears are just part of the aging process. So it's more likely to get a rotator cuff tear from the degenerative aging process than from having an intact rotator cuff falling down and then actually rupturing the rotator cuff. Mm -hmm. So a lot of patients will believe that they had an intact cuff fell down and tore it. Most often they've probably had a rotator cuff disease to some extent and it's caused to be symptomatic. Mm -hmm. If you look at the incidence of rotator cuff tears as we age, data suggests that anyone in their 60s, even those without pain, there's a 25% chance they have a full thickness tear of their rotator cuff. Oh, wow. And if you bring it up to 80s, probably about 50% of 80-year-olds uh, out there, those with and without pain will have a rotator cuff tear. Mm -hmm. So many patients can have rotator cuff tears without any symptoms there. So if we just went and MRI'd all our viewers' shoulders, we'd find that between somewhere in the 20 to 50% range would have 
some injury there that they may or may not have symptoms from. Correct. Yeah. In that 60 to 80 range, that's correct. Yeah. And that's why it's important not to treat or operate just based on what an MRI or an right. x-ray shows. What's really important is how the patient, how it's affecting a patient, if their ability, if can they respond to non-operative treatments. For the most part, the majority of people with shoulder problems can respond to non-operative mm -hmm. treatment, where the main indication for surgery is for the failure of non-operative treatment. Yeah. There's a small subset of, of shoulder problems that you probably should just go ahead and have surgery right away, but for the most part, there's a high likelihood if you have shoulder trouble that we can have a very good chance of getting you better in a non-operative fashion. Yeah, so what does non-operative fashion mean? What, what do you recommend, you know, maybe the first time you see someone, you think they have rotator cuff tendinitis or, or partial tear, what sure. do you recommend for them? So non-operative treatment consists of giving it time. Sometimes we get things that show up and they start aching and they give it enough time, it goes away spontaneously. Mm -hmm. So time, over-the-counter medicines, you know, your Tylenols, your, your anti-inflammatories, um, activity modification. So mm -hmm. avoiding activities that aggravate the shoulder are important. The mainstay of active treatment is physical therapy. Yeah. So educating a patient on a physical therapy program, and once they're educated on what to do, we like to transition to a home program. Mm -hmm. So if you can learn all the exercises and reproduce the same exercises that a therapist teaches you, then you can transition to a home program. So you don't necessarily need 25 visits with a physical therapist mm -hmm. when we're gonna treat you with a non-operative rehabilitation program. The use, the judicious use of corticosteroids, cortisone injections, mm -hmm. there's another type of injection called PRP, which may be considered. These are all things that we try and do first for people that have chronic or degenerative rotator cuff tears. Yeah, yeah. And then, you know, how, it, for the people that do get better, what kind of timeline does it usually take them? What can yeah. they expect? So I normally ask patients that are, are willing to do a non-operative approach is, let's give it six weeks, mm -hmm. okay? We need to give it enough time to make sure that our treatment works, but we don't want to give them too much time where they're wasting their life, just trying to wait for this to go away if it doesn't appear like it's getting better. Mm -hmm. So after six weeks, I ask them to see how much they're getting better. Are we continuing to see improvements? Are we seeing the light at the end of the tunnel? Mm -hmm. Or are we plateaued or worsening? Mm -hmm. If we plateau or worsening, then we're thinking about further imaging and then deciding if the surgical option, if the risk versus benefits are worthwhile. Yeah, yeah. So in summary, and this is good reinforcement because this is kind of how I do it in primary care, I, we often don't do an MRI when someone first comes in with shoulder pain if, if the history looks like rotator cuff pathology because we're gonna send them to physical therapy first in a lot of cases. So maybe you, you do that first before you do the advanced imaging? A lot of the times we do. Yeah. So in a younger patient, and by younger, I'm, I'm suggesting mid 50s and younger than that, you might wanna consider getting further imaging. Mm -hmm. um, but for insidious onset of shoulder pain, uh, when we're over mid 50s, the likelihood of non-operative treatment working is high. Yeah. I, I, I'm part of a, a, a group called the, the Moon Shoulder Group, and we actually enrolled 450 people across the country to a non-operative plan for a known physical therapy, of a known full thickness tear of the rotator cuff. Treat them with physical therapy and injections, and then follow them. Mm -hmm. And at two years, we had a 75% success rate where patients were still doing well without surgery. Wow. Looking at five years, we've maintained a 70% success rate, and now we're just accruing our 10-year data, mm -hmm. and it's not suggest, we, we don't have it for publication yet, mm -hmm. but it's looking like there's not a lot of deterioration for more people going on to surgery. Mm -hmm. So at 10 years, many patients who were diagnosed with a full thickness rotator cuff tear have continued to have a great life yeah. and success with a non-operative treatment plan. And that's interesting because I think when people hear that term full thickness tear, everyone thinks, well, I must need surgery if that's the case. But you're telling us that, that the, a high majority of people do really well without surgery, even with a full thickness tear. That's correct. Yeah. yeah. Um, and so rotator cuff being the most common, what kinds of symptoms would make you think, well, this shoulder pain actually doesn't sound like rotator cuff? Like, what, what is arthritis of the shoulder as, a, as opposed to rotator cuff sure. pathology? 
look so, like? So the symptoms a patient can, be, can experience are very similar. Yeah. It's more of a clinical examination finding okay. where someone with a rotator cuff tear, where I take their arm and move them passively, I should be able to move them quite well passively. They have difficulty with moving their arm on their own or active mm -hmm. range of motion. Where someone with arthritis will typically have decreased both active and passive range of motion. Mm -hmm. So the clinical exam is gonna help us differentiate between the two. Mm -hmm. um, X-rays also help, imaging right. helps because oftentimes we can diagnose osteoarthritis via X-ray. Sure, yeah. and then how about, you know, sometimes people will have pain in the upper extremity that's coming from a problem in the neck. Correct. How does that typically look different from shoulder yeah. pathology? So typical shoulder pain will not progress further than the elbow. Mm -hmm. um, rarely it can, so it's it's not definitive if it, if it if it goes past the elbow, sometimes I've seen that be in shoulder trouble. Mm -hmm. But that's one of the clues. Yeah. Look into the cervical spine. Number two, check the cervical spine range of motion. Three, where is the na where's their biggest pain generator? I always ask a patient, of all the spots that bother you, please put your finger on the spot that hurts you the worst. Mm -hmm. and a lot of patients will come back and say, my shoulder hurts, and they point back behind right. them here. That's more likely cervical spine-based mm -hmm. pain when they reach their shoulder blade or scapula. Mm -hmm. um, there's something called a Sperling's maneuver where they look back over their head and if that shoots pain into their shoulder, that's a potential sign of something called cervical radiculopathy, mm -hmm. a pinched nerve in the neck. Mm -hmm. uh, numbness and tingling typically does not come from shoulder pathology. That's more neurologic, cervical spine. So those are all some clues that yeah. we should start looking elsewhere if, if a patient reports that to us. Yeah, okay. So we've, we've seen the patient, they've gone to physical therapy for six weeks and this is the person that comes back and says, doc, I'm, I'm getting worse or definitely I'm not getting better and you're talking about surgery. So yeah. tell us a little bit about what surgery for rotator cuff pathology is like and yeah. I think we even have a little video footage that yeah. we can show. Yeah. We do. Mm -hmm. So um, in a patient that has a chronic or degenerative mm -hmm. tear of the rotator cuff, we'll, we'll look at this video here. Mm -hmm. So uh, underneath us uh, to the right to the screen is our rotator cuff tear and that's my shaver that's going underneath the tear of the rotator cuff and below that shaver is the bone, what we call the greater tuberosity, where the rotator cuff should insert. And so that is actually where in the rotator cuff tear itself. If you look past the shaver, you can just see the long head of the biceps tendon, that right there. And so right now I'm getting rid of all the tissue on the greater tuberosity so we can get a nice bleeding bed there so we can get the rotator cuff repaired. So to the right of the screen there is mm -hmm. the rotator cuff itself. Specifically, that's the supraspinatus, which is one of four of the rotator cuff tendons. Mm -hmm. So right now, that's my punch. I'm gonna put an anchor in. So right behind that is that long head of that biceps tendon. 60% of patients who have rotator cuff tears have biceps tendon problems as well. Um, that patient did not have a biceps tendon problem. So this is a awl or a punch that we're making a little hole for the anchor. That's a little bone marrow that's coming up. Here's our suture anchor. So you can see the sutures that are going through and here's our screw here. So that's gonna essentially anchor the uh, suture to the bone or the greater tuberosity here. So I'm screwing that in and this is all done through little tiny arthroscopic yeah. portals. Uh, I call them buttonhole type incisions there. Um, so the size of a button. Um, we're looking at uh, the shoulder through a camera itself. So when we're doing surgery, we're looking at a screen. Above us is the bone called the acromion. Um, so that's called the subacromal space. So here's a tissue grasper where I'm grabbing the sutures and pulling them out of a cannula. And then I have a suture passing device and I'm passing the sutures through the supraspinatus or the rotator cuff. And there my assistant's coming in with a grabber there and grabbing the sutures out of the front cannula there. So before we got to this, what the video didn't show, I would inspect the joint uh, to make sure there's not arthritis or labral pathology or biceps pathology there. So there I'm pulling the sutures out to the cannula here. And so right now we have two anchors medially or closer to the joint. And now I'm exposing the lateral or uh, outside aspect of the shoulder or the greater tuberosity and I'm going to anchor those sutures down with two more anchors uh, to the outside there. So there'll be a total of four anchors. So two are already in place and this is the third anchor going in. So we're going to punch that with an awl. And then we're going to take the sutures that we've already passed through the rotator cuff and we're going to anchor it down into that spot there.
So you can see the suture is pulling the rotator cuff taut, and this is the lateral or outside anchor. Pulling tension on the suture there, you can just see that on the corner with the tension I was pulling on that, and then would it screw that anchor into bone there. And there's this anchor going in. And then we'll take the applicator out. You'll see we left that white anchor in there, and now we'll cut the sutures here. Mm -hmm. And this is all what we call arthroscopic surgery, so using a small camera that goes into the joint space, and, and, and you're seeing what you're seeing on, sort of on a big video screen in the operating room. That's is correct. that pretty much how all rotator cuff surgery is done now? Does anyone cut, a, cut the joint open anymore to do all this stuff? It's, it's still done that way, yeah. um, but it doesn't have to be done that way anymore. Yeah. Um, you have to have a, a larger incision. You have to violate the deltoid. Um, I do believe there's more pain when you make the larger sure. incision to do the rotator cuff. Now you can repair it that way. Mm -hmm. And what we normally say is if the surgeon should do it the way that they're good at it. So yeah. if that's the way the surgeon's good at it and not good at it arthroscopically, then it should be done that way. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, I've been doing it arthroscopically. I, I, in training, I learned how to do it open, but uh, that was for training purposes yeah. and I do them all arthroscopically. Yeah. Um, you asked about what's, what's a rotator cuff repair entail. So that was a little quick video. Right. You know, doing a rotator cuff repair, in that patient it took about 20 minutes. Sometimes you have to do varying procedures, treat the biceps. Mm -hmm. Sometimes you have to do a lot more anchors. So it can take up to an hour, sometimes an hour and a half in really complex cases. Mm -hmm. um, and typically outpatient surgery, very rarely do you have to stay in the hospital. We do keep you in a sling for six weeks to protect you. Number one, God forbid if you fall, your arm's close to your side. Number two, it prevents instinctual motions. You drop something, you go to grab it. Sure. That will stress out the repair. So while you're in the sling, you can write, you can type, you can feed yourself, you can move your arm mm -hmm. to your hand and vice versa. That's a little frustrating for the first six weeks. Yeah. From six to 12 weeks, we're out of the sling doing light activity, shoulder height and below. And normally I say patient can start using five pounds or less. Mm -hmm. Right after surgery, they're not handing someone five pounds away from their body, but they're doing things close to their side. Mm -hmm. Three months, they let them start progressing heavier activity, shoulder height and below. Mm -hmm. Five months before repetitive or heavy activity, returning to contact type sports. Mm -hmm. A lot of physical therapy afterwards. Yeah. Physical therapy, we start off formally with a physical therapist, mm -hmm. doing home program as well. Right around the three month point, we try and transition a lot of patients to a home program. I ask patients to work on a home program up to a year from surgery. Yeah. I've shown in some of my studies that I've published that you're gonna to continue to build strength up to a year from surgery. Mm -hmm. So although that you're getting back to the activities that you want to do at the five to six month point, you're going to still see optimization and strength up to a year from surgery. So working on those rotator cuffs, uh, strengthening exercises at home are really valuable. Yeah, great. That's a great transition to our first role in here. Orthopedic surgery often involves post-operative physical therapy to maximize the benefits of the procedure. Brookings Health System Rehab and Therapy Post. Director Gavin Weber tells us more about its importance. Important is because people don't understand how to progress or what they're what they may be able to do or what they shouldn't do. Those are the most of the questions that we have. Um, post operatively, people have a lot of questions after any orthopedic surgery, um, and so we try to we do stretching and we do exercises, but we also answer and field a lot of questions on is this normal? Is Am I at where I should be at? Am I behind? And if they are, we're honest with them and, and tell them, you know, you should really focus on this or you should focus on that. Um, and I think it is important to know that we, we do exercises, we do stretching, we assess the joint, um, we look at the incision, uh, we check for, you know, if they have signs of a blood clot, those types of things, um, but we offer, um, progression ideas. So typically we start off with kind of a, an exercise where the patient kind of loosens up. Uh, we start on that machine, it's called a new step. Other people use maybe a bicycle, something like that. And then we may go into exercise right away and then eventually stretching, but it depends on what the person needs. Eventually we want to get people back to what they were doing before or better than what they did before. So that may be going up and down stairs, or if it's an ACL, it may be running. 
after a total knee, I would say we see people on average for about six weeks. We may see them for four, we may see them for 12. Every person's a little different. It just depends on how long that arthritis has been there. It depends on their activity level prior to surgery, their prior strength, and other things that are going on with the person. We take a lot of stock in programs. I tell people all the time, it doesn't matter what we do here for 45 minutes. It matters what you do outside of here that is gonna make the difference in your recovery, most likely. So, and that's why I say we give a lot of advice. We do exercise and, and, and stretching, but we also give a lot of advice. And important part of that is home exercise program is, is very important in recovery. So that, that was a good segment on physical therapy, which is a really important part of before and after surgical care um, for a lot of orthopedic surgeries, right? Correct. Yeah. Physical therapy is an essential part of the care team mm -hmm. uh, in uh, preoperative, uh, non-operative, and post-operative care. Yeah, yeah. So we have some questions coming in. Let's get to some of those. Um, we have one viewer who asked us, what happens when a person outlives their artificial joints? So I, I assume maybe they're talking about an artificial knee replacement. Is it possible to have a joint replaced more than once? I get asked this question a lot, and I don't, I don't usually have a good answer for people. Is there a lifespan of, you know, an artificial knee or an artificial hip? Th there is a lifespan. Mm -hmm. um, it's not a definitive lifespan, so we can't tell the individual you need to expect this period of time. When I was in training um, about starting 20 years ago, we would tell people expect 20 years out of a knee replacement. Um, as time goes on, you have more follow-up. And right now, we're telling people expect 30 years out of a knee replacement. Mm -hmm. As time goes on, we might be able to prove that people can last 40 years sure. with that. So, um, you know, ideally, we would like to be one and done. Yeah. And that's why it's important to, um, you know, kind of trying to optimize non-operative treatments if you mm -hmm. can, not do surgery unnecessarily. Uh, but when it's time, when a patient's not responding to non-operative approaches and their quality of life is just poor and they decide it's time for mm -hmm. a joint replacement, that's when we typically do a joint replacement. Mm -hmm. um, but yes, uh, joint replacements can fail. Mm -hmm. um, if you look at the results of revision, arthroplasty or revision joint replacement compared to primary, which is the first time, the primary ones have higher patient satisfaction uh, and less complications than a revision. So patients can still do well with a revision arthroplasty, but it's a more difficult procedure mm -hmm. for the patient to get through and also for the surgeon to typically do. Right, yeah. right. Um, what, what kind of things do happen that you would call complications after a joint replacement surgery? What, you know, if someone's having pain and maybe this is years after surgery, what kind of things do you look for when you're in the office to see if it has to do with the old joint replacement? Sure. You know, right after surgery, we're looking for, you know, acute complications that are concerned or infection. Mm -hmm. Anytime you have surgery, anytime you break the skin, it's a risk. Now, luckily, the risk of infection is less than 1%. Mm -hmm. So it's not a high rate, right. but it can be catastrophic for those that do get it. So we're looking for signs of infection. We are looking at signs, as uh, the physical therapist mentioned before, of a blood clot. Sure. Uh, blood clot is a risk of orthopedic surgery. So those are things that we're looking for there. Um, you know, depending on what joint replacement that you're doing, you know, with shoulder replacements, which I do, we look for signs for rotator cuff failure. So we actually have to cut through the front rotator cuff called the subscapularis when we do an anatomic total shoulder replacement. Mm -hmm. So we're looking for signs of that, which could be shoulder instability or weakness. Mm -hmm. um, we do look for loosening of the socket. So on a shoulder replacement, the weak part is the socket. So we use radiographs to see if there are uh, signs of um, uh, loosening there. Mm -hmm. We look for potential other source of symptoms. So right. it might not be the shoulder that's bothering you or the knee. It could mm -hmm. potentially be a, a pinched nerve, a cervical radiculopathy. It could be a lumbar radiculopathy, a pinched nerve at the back. Mm -hmm. uh, it could be hip arthritis that causes pain to the knee. So joint pain at the hip can radiate down to the knee. Sure. So we look for other potential sources as well, mm -hmm. uh, not just for potential complications of the, the joint replacement. The good news is typically joint replacement, there's a high level of satisfaction and a low rate of complications, but it's something that we have to pay attention to. Right, right. Um, 
Instead of receiving a knee replacement procedure, one viewer had heard the option of cortisone shots. How would cortisone shots um, be, be uh, helpful and how often would they have to be injected to compare to fixing the issue with a total knee replacement? Sure. Yeah. Cortisone, corticosteroid, is a tried and true treatment for osteoarthritis of really most of the joints in the body. Yeah. Uh, cortisone is a potent or very strong anti-inflammatory where ibuprofen and Motrin are a weaker anti-inflammatory that we ingest and it goes to everywhere in our body. We can focally put the very strong anti-inflammatory cortisone at the joint and it can shut down the inflammation and therefore provide pain relief in someone who's got osteoarthritis. Mm -hmm. Um, so cortisone is probably the main treatment there. Um, there are some theoretical risks with cortisone. A lot of patients hear all the bad connotations of cortisone, um, but there are great, they can provide great relief. Yeah. Now one of the connotations of, uh, the negative connotations or theoretical concerns with cortisone is it might be a little toxic or injurious to the cartilage. Mm. Uh, first of all, if you're having intractable pain and your only other option is a joint replacement right. and you already have damaged cartilage, that risk of that concern is so low compared to the potential benefit. Mm -hmm. Now, I also had a concern because I've used cortisone throughout training. It's mm -hmm. kind of the standard of care in orthopedics. Mm -hmm. And I've heard some studies that suggest that it's chondrotoxic or dangerous to the cartilage. Mm -hmm. um, there was a colleague of mine who tested the mixture that I use, 0.25% bupivacaine and 40 milligrams of Depomedrol, mm -hmm. and showed in cellular studies it's not chondrotoxic. Mm -hmm. In addition, I published a study in the Journal of Shoulder and Elbow surgery where I took patients that had adhesive capsulitis or frozen shoulder syndrome mm -hmm. where we've done those injections and followed them for approximately eight years afterwards and found out there were no consequences of chondrotoxicity, osteoarthritis, and all the patients were doing well. Mm -hmm. So that's a theoretical concern. Now every time we as physicians make a recommendation to our patients, we weigh risks versus benefits in our head. And we clearly will state if there is a high risk to a treatment option. Right. And we try and avoid treatment options that have high risk and low benefit. We err on the side of high benefit and low risk. And for most patients, corticosteroid, I think is a high benefit, low risk treatment yeah. option. Yeah, and you know, the, the, the downsides that people are familiar with, with things like steroids in general, things like elevated blood sugars and, and things like that, very, very uncommon for that to happen with a joint injection as opposed to if you're taking a steroid by pill form. So definitely correct. Um, yeah, I always encourage people to give it a try. At least there's not much downside, especially if they're miserable enough that they're going to see the orthopedic surgeon about it. So mm -hmm. um, good. Uh, what? Let's see. One viewer had a stem cell treatment where they took cells from the hip and placed it in the knee. Is this common? And what would you expect as far as um, relief period? Sure. Mm -hmm. Stem cells are popular right now. Mm -hmm. um, gets a lot of attention and you'll see that a lot throughout medicine. You know, treatment with lasers, stem mm -hmm. cells, um, and so it's got kind of the nation's attention. Now, I think the use of stem cells right now should be on the research side yeah. because we've never proven that stem cells really work. Mm -hmm. And the problem is a lot of these stem cells will they'll charge a patient thousands and thousands of dollars for a treatment that hasn't been substantiated with science and good clinical outcomes. Mm -hmm. So I would suggest if someone is considering stem cell treatment to search out a study yeah. or a research program with mm -hmm. a study where if they do that, they're typically not charging someone for it. Mm -hmm. um, and then for us to scientifically see if it works. Now I think that potentially in the future, if we can really harness science and stem cells and understand how to use them, it potentially could be the future, biologics. Now my problem is, how does a stem cell know that you inject into the knee that it should transition to articular cartilage, which is the mm -hmm. cartilage on the end of the bone, or maybe it should transition to meniscus because that's what you've lost is meniscus, mm -hmm. or maybe it should be more of a ligament there. We haven't understand the signaling pathways to tell the stem cells what mm -hmm. to become. And so just taking stem cells either from our adipose or fat layer or from our bone marrow, which it sounds like it was taken from the hip, the bone marrow of the pelvis, and then injecting them back into a joint, to me it hasn't been substantiated enough with good clinical science mm -hmm. where I can comfortably tell a patient, you really should use this. Yeah, still experimental really think so. from, from a scientific standpoint, good. Um, one viewer was curious if gout can cause joint damage. 
Gout can definitely cause joint pain yeah. and pretty <laughs> terrible joint pain. Yeah. Um, and when you do an arthroscopy, much like you just saw with the shoulder there, you can see these crystals throughout the joint. Um, probably theoretically, it can cause damage mm -hmm. there. We know it can happen in the fingers there. Mm -hmm. The question is the gout, the uh, uh, ramification of developing osteoarthritis, or, or they, is it separate there? Sure. So more likely than not, in addition to causing the tremendous pain, I do think it can cause joint damage. Yeah, yeah, especially if chronic. Um, one viewer tore their rotator cuff 15 years ago and experienced soreness up until about five years ago. Now it throbs all the time for them. Should they come in and get it checked out? The answer is always yes when you ask the prairie docs if you should go see your doctor. But <laughs> Yeah, especially if something's been bothering you for yeah. 15 years. You know, if it's been bothering you for 15 days and it's, it's mild and it's getting better, mm -hmm. sometimes things can get better spontaneously. But I think at 15 years it's declared itself that it's probably not going to go away without assistance. Now you have to determine if the, the symptoms that you're having are bad enough to see a specialist for it. Mm -hmm. It sounds like if you're asking the question, it's, it probably is. Yeah. yeah, yeah. At least go get it checked out. Yep. Um, all right, more than 80% of people older than age 50 want to age in their own homes for as long as possible. Sometimes that requires home modifications to keep people independent and safe. One important part of mitigating falls is having a home visit assessment and as occupational therapy therapists, we go through the home and look at every room, even the entrance to see um, if there are any safety issues throughout the house. And we always use a form. We go through from front to back. That way we can provide recommendations based on the patient's most specific needs. So we'll start with the entrance of the house. There's stairs or ramp, and our recommendation is usually a ramp to get in, whether you need a wheelchair or a walker. It's important to kind of avoid steps because that could be a big fall risk. So in the kitchen, what we would typically look at is um, making sure that things are accessible and reachable for our patients. So that includes making sure things in the cupboards are at a lower height and to make sure that they don't have to bend over too far or stoop down low to get things out of cupboards as well. Another thing we want to talk about is making sure that throw rugs are taken up because they can be a trip or fall hazard, especially if they don't have a rubber backing. They might catch their walker on it or catch their foot on it if they go to stand at the sink or things like that. Another important thing that we look at in the kitchen is to make sure that everything is accessible, keeping the most used items on the counter where you can reach it, and then also using a walker tray or basket to transport items from different surfaces. Another area we assess in a patient's home is their bedroom. We like to make sure that they're able to get in and out of bed, whether that is if we need to lower the bed height or raise the bed height or add a bed rail for safety. We also look at things like lighting. Um, low lighting can be a leading cause of falls, especially during bathroom breaks in the middle of the night. So we always make sure that there's a light beside the bed or they have their cell phones or night lights. We also make sure that there's a place to hold their cell phone or their call button at night so that they can reach it in case of an emergency. The next room that we assess is the bathroom and we always take a look at what the person's setup is and what would be a reasonable change or what they can actually implement according to what they need. And so we would avoid having a bathtub. That's probably the one thing that we do recommend. The best setup is a walk-in shower. And we always recommend a shower chair to sit on for safety. Whether you sit on it the whole time or just part of the time for the shower, it's always there just in case. We also recommend grab bars. Get into the tub. Sit down on the shower chair and be able to safely complete their shower while seated and using the, the handheld shower head. All right, 
I love occupational therapy, so valuable to help people stay in their home and prevent falls. So we'll get back to some more viewer questions. This is a great question. One caller is wondering what the difference is between a total shoulder replacement and a reverse total shoulder replacement. Right. So what do those terms mean? So total shoulder replacement means that both the humerus or arm side is replaced and the socket side. Mm. So a reverse is also a total shoulder replacement. So I'll differentiate that between an anatomic total shoulder replacement and a reverse total shoulder replacement. So the anatomic is something that's done for osteoarthritis when a patient has an intact rotator cuff. And so that patient will best respond to an anatomic total shoulder replacement. A reverse total shoulder replacement is meant for someone who has a deficient or irreparably or unfixably torn rotator cuff or an unfixably torn rotator cuff with osteoarthritis. Mm -hmm. There's some other indications as well for the reverse, for shoulder instability, for fracture, but the main differentiation is the status of the rotator cuff, where actually the reverse shoulder replacement changes the mechanics of what we call the shoulder joint or the glenohumeral joint, mm -hmm. and it makes the lever arm of the deltoid longer. Mm -hmm. And it's much like a seesaw. If you have a longer seesaw, it's easy to lift the other end. And so it makes the deltoid more biomechanically efficient to do the work of both the rotator cuff and the deltoid. So that's why the reverse total shoulder replacement functions in patients with an unfixable rotator cuff tear. Okay. What, what's recovery like for a shoulder replacement surgery as opposed to, we've talked about the rotator cuff surgery. Yeah, mm -hmm. so in general for an anatomic shoulder replacement, it's very similar to a rotator cuff repair because the rate limiting step of healing in the anatomic shoulder replacement is the healing of the subscapularis mm -hmm. rotator cuff. So we have to actually cut that tendon do our work and sew that tendon back down. So in, mm -hmm. a, in essence, it's the same protection you need for a rotator cuff repair. Now the interesting thing is the reverse shoulder replacement. You're not waiting for a tendon or a rotator cuff to heal, so patients respond faster. Mm -hmm. I let patients wean out of a sling at their own comfort for reverse shoulder replacement, where the anatomic they need to wear it for six weeks. Mm -hmm. So I think the recovery time has been it, the recovery time is faster for a yeah. reverse shoulder replacement. And the funny thing is, when you do a shoulder replacement, which is done through a big incision, mm -hmm. compared to an arthroscopic rotator cuff tear done through tiny little incisions, typically the total shoulder replacement patients feel better faster mm -hmm. than the more minimally invasive surgery. Mm -hmm. I think they've been dealing with pain a lot longer, sure. and the relief uh, is more immediate with the joint replacement compared to the tendon repair. Gotcha, gotcha. We have one viewer who has a large bone spur on their shoulder, and they were wondering what the best treatment option would be. Um, they, they wonder whether it would be to file it down and just remove the spur or to do a total shoulder replacement. Maybe yeah. it depends on some other factors. What, what yeah. kind of factors do you take into consideration? So the, the first question I would have is the typical spur a patient is talking about is one that you can't see when you look at the shoulder. It's mm -hmm. deep. It's on the bone called the acromion bone. And what happens is you get a calcification of a ligament called the coracochromial ligament. Mm -hmm. You can also have, a patient can have a spur that they can see visibly by having, getting, developing arthritis at the acromioclavicular joint. Um, so the more popular spur that's known about in the public is this, this one that's deep. Mm -hmm. And there's a common misconception that a spur is the definitive source of a problem. Mm -hmm. And there are actually studies that show that taking all comers who have what we call impingement or rotator cuff tendinopathy, these patients with these spurs, that there's no benefit from taking patients with initial treatment and doing surgery for them. So the indication again mm -hmm. for someone who has a spur to have surgery is for the failure of non-operative treatment. Mm -hmm. Because there are plenty of people out there that have spurs that have no idea because they're having no pain right. and they haven't gotten x-rays on their shoulder. Mm -hmm. So for the most part, a patient with a spur can do well non-operatively. Now there's a certain scenario where if they fail non-operative treatment, then there is the 
you can do arthroscopically can remove that spur mm -hmm. and um, essentially it's for treatment of a rotator cuff problem. Mm -hmm. Now a patient can also have a spur from arthritis. Sure. And so that's a spur that is on the ball of the, mm -hmm. so of the socket. And those typically we treat with, again, non-operatively. And if they have a spur that's not responding to non-operative treatment that comes from arthritis mm -hmm. of the main joint, the glenohumeral joint, then that's that shoulder replacement that the caller in was uh, yeah. alluring to. Yeah, good. What would the treatment plan look like for a winged scapula that protrudes out the back if it has already been present for about 10 years? Yeah, so that, can you explain what this, this person means? Sure, and that, that is a very fantastic question. Mm -hmm. So our scapula or our shoulder blade, there are some patients that when they raise their arm up, mm -hmm. instead of the shoulder blades hugging the thoracic cage or your rib cage, that they stick out, mm -hmm. okay? Now some patients, that's just a normal variant. Mm -hmm. They have no trouble, no pain, full function, and their shoulder blades just wing. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now there are some patients that develop winging because they're having troubles with other parts of their shoulder. They're having instability of their shoulder and it's a compensatory mechanism. So we would try and identify what is the source of their troubles and try and, if it's a secondary problem, address the primary problem, the labrum or the weak scapular muscles. Now there are some patients that can have neurogenic winging mm -hmm. or winging that comes from a nerve injury. Mm -hmm. uh, one of the nerves that could be injured is the long thoracic nerve and that can come from tension from overuse or a fall. Mm -hmm. There are patients that can get a biopsy of a lymph node and if uh, the lymph node is too close to a nerve called cranial nerve 11, you can injure that nerve that innervates the trapezius muscle and cause winging. Mm -hmm. For those patients, we try our best to treat them with, with non-operative techniques, but rarely we have to do complicated tendon transfers called a triple transfer mm -hmm. and move some of the scapular muscles, the, the, uh, the rhomboid muscles and the levator mm -hmm. over to compensate for the trapezius. Mm -hmm. Complicated surgery, patients need to be in a brace with their arm over their head mm -hmm. for about eight weeks. Um, it's tough. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So and so if you're if it's not causing a problem or not associated with other problems, but may, there may be not a reason to yeah. treat if, this at if, all though. If you're not having pain and you yeah. just look in the mirror and the shoulder blades come out and you can do everything you want to do, I'd ignore it. Mm -hmm. But if you're having pain, there's some things that we can consider. Yeah, good. One caller is curious if gel injections would be a sustainable temporary treatment for someone who may not want to undergo a procedure. Yeah, yeah. So, so those gel injections are called visco supplementation mm -hmm. um, and it's something called hyaluronic acid. Someone very bright found out that knees that have arthritis are lacking in hyaluronic acid. Mm -hmm. They suggested, hey, what if we supplement these knees with hyaluronic acid? Patients know these also as rooster comb yeah. injections because mm -hmm. rooster combs are rich in hyaluronic acid. Mm -hmm. And it has been shown in data to be just as effective as corticosteroid uh, for the treatment of osteoarthritis. So it is another uh, 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 arrow in our quill, as you can mm -hmm. per se, for treatment of osteoarthritis. Um, it is a more expensive medicine. We have to go through a little bit more pre-authorization mm -hmm. um, hoops to jump through with insurance to do that, but it is an option that does work for some. Yeah, yeah, okay. Um, a caller was wondering when it's appropriate to take further action in dealing with shoulder pain as when someone would move on from just therapy to taking further steps with a physician. And we talked a little bit, you know, usually you said you usually will tell people to give it six weeks of therapy yeah. is a good timeline to give, but it may depend on other factors. What would you advise? Yeah. Um, well, if, if things are heading in the wrong way fast, okay, if your pain is getting worse, um, then you might want to, you know, think about doing something sooner, uh, getting reevaluated, letting your physician know that I'm, I'm having trouble. It's not going the way that I expected it to. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it's, it's. Um, you want to give it enough time to see if it's going to work. But if something's deviated from your expectations significantly, get in touch with your physician and review that with them. Yeah, good. Uh, one viewer has a ganglion cyst in their shoulder joint and they're wondering what could be done to relieve pain or a particular procedure that could remove or treat the cyst. Yeah, mm -hmm. so ganglion cysts can come in different areas in the shoulder. Probably one of the more common areas you get a ganglion cyst is at the acromioclavicular joint where the collarbone meets the acromion bone. 
If it's at that point, that's easy to get to. We can use an ultrasound device, find that cyst. You can decompress that cyst with a needle, put a little corticosteroid in there. Now, sometimes that cyst can be a sign of something called Milwaukee shoulder, which is someone who's got rotator cuff tear arthropathy, a very long-standing tear of the rotator cuff with arthritis. The shoulder makes fluid. It finds its way to the areas of least pressure, least resistance, and comes up through that area there. So that's a potential sign of that. Now, you can also have a ganglion cyst that's deep that's not apparent from looking at the shoulder. Sometimes you can get something called a spinoglenoid notch cyst that happens from having a labral tear. Mm -hmm. Not truly a ganglion cyst, but you know, it's, it's comparable. Mm -hmm. And then you can get some ganglion cysts around the rotator cuff. Those you can't see physically. You typically need to have an MRI to find mm -hmm. that. Mm -hmm. Okay, so there are some things that aren't surgery per se though that could correct a, a treat lot some of, of those. a lot of ganglion cysts are coincidental sure. findings to what is actually going on issues. but it's something that to discuss with your physician yep okay um, one one caller asked what are some ways to get rid of scar tissue and keloids fa following a surgical procedure Is yeah. that something you ever deal with Yes, um, mm -hmm. we, we think that keloiding is more of a genetic mm -hmm. uh, factor than how we potentially can close a wound. Mm -hmm. um, and sometimes these keloids can become quite obvious. Um, I, I, I lean on my friends, the dermatologists, who've yeah. actually instructed me on what to do. Mm -hmm. You can actually inject some corticosteroid, that cortisone again, uh, subcutaneously to try and thin that out. I've gotten to the point where if I have a patient who's unsatisfied with a keloid, I normally send them to a dermatologist to kind of help them with that. Yeah, yeah. good. Uh, time for maybe one or two more questions. We have a caller that just had a reverse shoulder replacement and is struggling with mobility and wondering what the next step should be. Yeah, I guess the key question is what time oh, after wow. surgery? Yeah. Now, if this is immediately after surgery, Oftentimes you're going to struggle with range. Of, you, you may struggle with range of motion within the first couple months. Mm -hmm. um, if you if this is many months out and you've plateaued and you're not improving, then we've got to investigate what the why that's the case. Mm -hmm. um, sometimes after reverse shoulder replacement. The reverse shoulder placement, as I mentioned, puts some more tension on the deltoid muscle. The deltoid inserts on the acromion. You can actually get a stress fracture there. Mm -hmm. So that's one of the things that we should look into. Do you have a stress fracture there? Mm -hmm. Is there potentially a nerve injury there? Um, we want to make sure that the components are aligned appropriately and you haven't had a dislocation. So I would suggest that you get back with your, your surgeon and have them reevaluate you and uh, make sure that we don't have a complication. Make sure it just Hopefully, it's just part of the recovery just process. Normal recovery. Yep. Okay. Briefly, we have a question about athletes and shoulder injuries. Are you more aggressive going straight to surgery in an athlete who has a, an acute shoulder injury than the general population? At times, you might want to be. Yeah. And it, it really comes down to timing. Um, if it's an in-season injury, we're going to try and do our best to treat someone non-operatively, even if it's a surgical problem, to see if, if, if they choose, if they want to continue right. playing during season. If it's right after season, we're more likely to consider a surgery on someone else who's a non-athlete who has time to recuperate and doesn't have a deadline in the future. And I think as I mentioned to you before, mm -hmm. some of my professional athletes right now are farmers. Yeah. <laughs> uh, they're not true athletes, but they have the but same they're season. Timeline. They're on a yeah. timeline. Yeah. And when they have an injury, they need to get better by, you right. know, by planting. So it's the same sort of thing that you have to look at the timing of the injury to and the patient and what their needs are yeah. and what their goals are. So sometimes you would be a little bit more aggressive with offering a patient mm -hmm. the option of surgery. They get to choose, <laughs> but they might choose to do it because they were on a timeline. Right. Good. Now for the answer to tonight's Prairie Doc quiz question. The decision to undergo joint replacement surgery should be based upon the appearance of x-ray, how much impact arthritis has on an individual patient's functioning, the individual patient's health, baseline physical function, and surgical risk. The answer is D. B and C are important considerations when contemplating surgery. And the winner of tonight's quiz is Bob Lear from Canton, South Dakota. Thank you, Bob, for participating, and a book will be in the mail soon. We'll be right back after this. Have you heard? The Prairie Doc has a podcast. Listen to Prairie Doc Radio and On Call with the Prairie Doc wherever you get your podcasts. These programs feature physicians and other health professionals discussing various medical topics important to you and your family. Look for Prairie Doc on SoundCloud, Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, and more. The Prairie Doc Podcast. 
My grandmother was a lively, caring, wonderful woman who remained very active late in her life. One spring day, after an unusual April blizzard, she stepped out of her apartment on her way to her weekly bridge game. She fell on the ice in an event that led to an open ankle fracture and changed the course of the remainder of her life. We all know that a fall, especially in an elderly or frail person, can result in disaster. Major fall-related injuries, such as hip fractures, can sometimes precede abrupt decline in function and death in the worst cases. While many falls don't result in any injury at all, when I discuss falls with my patients, I consider those events near misses and potentially catastrophic for any elderly or frail person. Falls can have many causes and often numerous factors contribute. Some factors can be modified by at-risk people and some cannot. Discussing the mechanism and contributors to falls with one's healthcare provider, or even better, a physical or occupational therapist, can help identify those factors. If a person can reduce their risk of fall and injury, by all means, we want to help. Modifiable risk factors might include weakness in large muscle groups, need for and proper use of an assistive device such as a walker or cane, and potential hazards in one's home such as rugs or bathtubs. Of course, in some patients there may be fall risk factors which cannot be easily modified, which might result in the decision for extra help or a change in living arrangement. After my grandmother's ankle fracture, she had a rocky course. She endured surgeries, bone infection, hospitalizations, and other medical complications. She never regained the ability to walk independently again and spent much of the last couple of years of her life in a nursing home where she could receive the care she required. Last summer, my grandmother contracted COVID-19 at her nursing facility and sadly died a few weeks later. A woman who led a truly remarkable life lost her fierce independence after an accidental fall. I'm sure if she could have gone back in time, she would have just stayed home that icy April day. If you or a loved one is worried about falling, I hope you will talk to your primary care provider about it. Big thank you to Dr. Baumgarten for volunteering to come to our studio and offer his experience to our discussion tonight. We sincerely appreciate it. For the past year, we've been living with the pandemic caused by the COVID-19 virus. Over 500,000 people in the United States have died in that time. While more of us are getting vaccinated each day, 41% of Americans have had at least one dose. We can't relax just yet. If we're going to get past this, we need everyone to get vaccinated. And in the meantime, keep washing your hands, distancing, and wearing a mask. That does it for tonight from all of us here at On Call with the Prairie Doc. Until next time, stay healthy out there, people. Over the past year, we've gotten more comfortable with working over the internet. Medical providers had already been using our technology for treatments. Telemedicine, next time on Call with the Prairie Doc. So, Mom, it's 20 years ago now that you and Dad uh, started this idea of uh, evidence-based medical shows for free for everyone. Does that sound right? That's right. And it was really great that you and, and your dad were able to create that theme music for us. Yeah, that was really cool. Making music with dad, one of the best things. You know, I, as long as I can remember, you and dad were pouring your energy and your heart and your soul into, into the Prairie Dock and into the Healing Words Foundation. And I'm just really proud of you. It's great to have people of your generation, like our new Prairie Docs, to uh, give us your ideas and to help continue Dad's legacy. It's our turn to uh, turn to the people out there and say, we need your help. <laughs> 
you can support us too. Uh, we do this without advertisements. We need independent support. So go to perrydoc.org and make a donation today. And uh, if you don't have money for that, keep coming to see our show. We need your support in other ways. Thanks. Thanks. Major funding for On Call with the Prairie Dock has been provided by. Avera is a proud sponsor of On Call with the Prairie Dock on South Dakota Public Broadcasting. Larson Manufacturing is proud to support On Call with the Prairie Dock as it continues to open doors for important medical information. And with the ongoing support of these individuals and institutions, Brookings Health System, Ophthalmology Limited, South Dakota Academy of Family Physicians, Avera Heart Hospital, First Bank and Trust, South Dakota Foundation for Medical Care, Dakota Allergy and Asthma, Vance Thompson Vision, Monument Health, Black Hills Medical Society, Brookings Madison Flandreau District Medical Society, Pier District Medical Society, Sioux Falls District Medical Society, Yankton District Medical Society, Aberdeen District Medical Society, Urology Specialists, Orthopedic Institute, Physicians Care Sanford Clinic Community Service Committee, Lake Ponset Sailing Academy, Aberdeen Asthma and Allergy, Dakota Bank, South Dakota American College of Physicians, and Swift Telecommunications. Communications.